Morning guys and welcome to our assembly for today. So Wednesday's assembly, see if you can remember what it was. Tell your adult that you're with. See if you can remember the book that we used for the theme. So our theme was reduced inequalities, one of our global goals, because we were talking about racism and how wrong racism is, following all of the things in the news about the Black Lives Matter campaigns. And the book that we used was a really, really cool book. It was this one, Little Leaders, Bold Women in Black History. Now, there's another one in the same series. It's called Bold Men in Black History. And I had a good look through, and there were just too many people to choose from. So I had a look at one of the other series of books that we've been using um, in our assemblies. And I had a look at Martin Luther King, and I had a look at Jesse Owens. And then I wanted to read about Jesse Owens, and then I wanted to read about Martin Luther King. So I've decided to treat myself and I'm going to read both of them to you because they're both quite short stories and they're both amazing amazing people but for very very different reasons so I'm going to read about Jesse Owens first okay so here's the story of Jesse Owens okay now have a look at the picture I bet if you look closely that you can see a clue why Jesse Owens is quite a cool person that's right look at these medals around his chest where do you think he won those so let's have a look. Now little Jesse was the youngest child of the Owens, a humble family of farmers from Alabama. He was the tenth and last of his siblings. Imagine having uh, nine brothers and sisters. But when his mother called for dinner, he beat everyone else to the table because he was the fastest. At school no one could catch him. His gym teacher was so impressed he asked him to join the track team after school, so running round a track. But Jesse had to uh, run to work, repairing shoes and delivering groceries to support his family at home. Of course, that didn't stop Jesse. He decided to practice in the morning when the sun was rising and everyone was still in bed. He was determined to become the best athlete in the world. So he was actually so determined that he got up before everybody else because he couldn't train after school because he was working. Jesse's first lesson was to imagine the track was on fire. Now, even though that wasn't true, the track wasn't actually on fire. It helped him develop his own elegant running style, keeping his feet off the ground as much as possible. So there you go. If you want to get yourself to really improve your running, see if you can lift your legs uh, like Jesse Owens did. See if you can find a video on YouTube of him running. He entered Ohio State University, where everybody called him the Buckeye Bullet. Jesse became the first African-American captain of a university team and the first who had to work as a lift operator in order to pay for his schooling. So um, at that point in America, there would be somebody in posh hotels and places like that. There would be somebody standing in a lift and you'd walk into the lift and you'd say, I'd like to go to the 17th floor, please. And uh, the lift operator like Jesse would press the button for you. So he was still working and still managing to train, and still getting himself through university. Imagine his determination and dedication. Despite Jesse's success on the track, he had to wait for his teammates to take their showers before he could wash himself. Now all around him, life was separated for black and white people. So there was a big communal shower, he wasn't allowed to go in because the people didn't think it was right that people with, a different, uh, with uh, black skin weren't allowed to go in at the same time. Black people and white people was different. And during one single championship, Jesse set three world records and tied in a fourth in only 45 minutes. Can you imagine setting that many world records in just three quarters of an hour? It was one of the most celebrated moments in the history of sports and a good chance for Jesse to prove himself before the Olympic Games. So he set those world records, but that wasn't actually in the Olympics. So we got 9.4 seconds for the 100 yards. 20.3 seconds for 220 yards, 8 metres 13 for the long jump, and 22.6 seconds for the 220 yards low hurdles. That's amazing. The Olympics were held in Berlin in Germany. Now in 1936 the country was ruled by a terrible, terrible man called Adolf Hitler. Hitler believed that white athletes were superior because they were white, and Jesse won a gold medal and stole the spotlight from Hitler's hateful, hateful regime. So it's an amazing thing to do. And given that he knew what Hitler was like, amazingly brave to go and do that as well. More than 110,000 people stayed to watch Jesse win three more gold medals over the next few days. 
He was an Olympic hero, the fastest man in history, but he was still a humble person and he was happy to hug his toughest rival. When Jesse arrived home, there was a dinner in his honour. So lots of people went out and celebrated the fact that he was there and they went to this big hotel where there were lots of guests. But as soon as he got there, he realised nothing had changed. He wasn't allowed to go in through the front doors because black people had to go round the back of the hotel and they weren't allowed to use the same way into the hotel as white people. How wrong is that? How awful is that? So the, regardless of how amazing Jesse Owens was and the things that he'd done, for anybody to be treated that way is just terrible. Sadly, soon after, no one remembered Jesse's amazing achievements and he had to take any job to make a living. He worked in a petrol station, toured with a jazz band, and he even accepted a race against horses just for a bit of entertainment. And what a shame that he'd done such amazing things in the Olympics but then couldn't enjoy the fame of it afterwards. He'd retired when he finally got his most valuable award, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest honour for any American. No athlete embodied the struggle against injustice and racism more than Jesse. And every time the Olympic Games take, uh, take place, little Jesse is remembered. The humble boy who fought the wind and sought out new sights, running just on the strength of his feet and the courage of his lungs. So there we go, we've got some uh, pictures there from 1930, from 1932, from 1936 in the Olympic Games, and you can see how fast he's running, and 1976. So an amazing, amazing athlete who really stood up for what he believed in and said, yes, I can do this, I'm an amazing runner, and it doesn't matter what colour my skin is, I'm still going to be an amazing runner as well. So we've got Jesse Owens, who's a real role model for loads and loads of people, and that's pretty cool because he made a massive impact on so many people because other people looked up at him and said I'm going to be an athlete like that as well and he didn't let anything stop him and that's that's an amazing thing that he did now I really wanted to share that story with you because Jesse Owens isn't um like he is very very well known but not massively mega famous when you talk about um particularly uh, black leaders. So I'm going to give you another story. It's somebody you've probably heard about, probably heard talk about, and I think we've talked about in assembly before, but he's such an amazing person that it's just worth talking about him anyway. So I'm going to share the story of Martin Luther King Jr. Okay, and just have a think back to see if you can remember anything about Martin Luther King. It might be something that you've learnt about in class, it might be something that you've we talked about in an assembly that you've heard about somewhere else. Right, here we go. Little Martin was a spiritual boy from Atlanta who came from a long line of preachers. His dad was a preacher, his uncle was a preacher, his grandfather was a preacher. Maybe he'd become a great preacher as well. One day, a friend invited him over to play. Martin was shocked when he was asked to leave because he was black. That day, he realised something terrible was going on. What an awful thing to happen. How terrible that you've got somebody who just wants to play with their friend, but then the mum says, go away because of your col the colour of your skin. This terrible thing was called segregation. It meant that public places like restaurants and buses had separate spaces for black and white people. Martin and his friend were sent to different schools and you can see they were really sad about it because we grow up, you grow up, knowing that racism is wrong, knowing that we can be color, uh, friends with anybody no matter what the colour of their skin, but it's only when we get told it by somebody else that we, uh, that we learn like, these things. So the more we th get told racism is bad, that we can be friends with anybody regardless of what the uh, colour of their skin is, the more we're going to believe that throughout our lives. Okay. Martin believed that one shouldn't remain silent or accept something if it's wrong. He promised himself that when he grew up, he'd fight injustice with the most powerful weapon of all, words. And that's really, really important because if you fight somebody or if you get angry with them, you'll only upset people, you'll only make people cross. But with words, you can persuade them and make them feel the same as you. And Martin studied at universities in Georgia, 
Pennsylvania and Massachusetts, where he read about Mahatma Gandhi, the man who'd improved the lives of millions of Indians with peaceful methods of protest. That's really important about peaceful protest. When he finished his studies, Martin moved to Alabama and became the pastor of a church in Montgomery. Every Sunday from his pulpit, he encouraged his congregation to speak up about things that mattered. And that's what people have been doing across the world recently, to speak up about racism. And sadly, some people have become violent about it, and that's wrong. But actually to say, to stand up and say, yes, racism is a bad thing, that's actually a good thing. We should stand up and say that. We should say what we believe. One evening, a woman called Rosa was arrested for refusing to give up her seat to a white man on a bus. Martin asked the people in his community not to take the bus again until the law was changed. Now, I'm sure that you all know that was Rosa Parks because we've talked about that story before. Many citizens were inspired by Rosa Parks' story and Martin's words, and suddenly buses were almost empty. They stayed empty for more than a year until segregation on Montgomery's buses finally ended. And what a simple, straightforward way to make a protest by just not taking the bus. Because if the system is wrong on a bus, don't do it. That's a really sensible way of uh, uh, protesting. It was the first major civil rights action in America, but not the last. Martin encouraged people all over the country to stand up for their rights and join in with peaceful protest. And that peaceful protest, again, is really important. They were often attacked, though. And sadly, Mar uh, Martin was arrested 29 times. But he and his followers never fought back with force. He knew that hate can't drive out hate. Only love can. And that's a really important thing. Racism is about hatred. It's about saying, I don't like you because of the colour of your skin. And we know that's wrong. And we can get grumpy, we can get shouty about it. And it's right to feel angry about something. But we need to persuade people, we need to show people that it doesn't matter what colour skin people have got, we treat everybody the same way. And if we show that love to everybody, regardless of the colour of their skin, then we can show by our examples that we're doing the right thing. Martin helped to organise a protest march on Washington, where he gave a life-changing speech. It began with four simple yet powerful words. I have a dream. The next year, Martin became the youngest person to win the Nobel Peace Prize. His words of hope, peace and justice called to a nation to change its laws and make them equal for everybody. So Martin Luther King was one of those people who worked towards that global goal right back in the 60s before uh, the global goals had even been invented. But we're following them now partly because of Martin Luther King's work. And if you listen to your heart, you can still hear little Martin asking you to keep his dream alive. A dream of a world where we're judged by our character, not by the colour of our skin. So there we go. We've got some pictures of Martin Luther King from 1953, from 1956, 1963 when he made that famous speech, and 1965. So his dream was for uh, people to be judged not by the colour of their skin, but by the content of their character. So that means that it doesn't matter what colour of skin you've got, we should judge people by, uh, by whether or not they're a nice person and whether or not they do nice things and, uh, and are lovely, lovely people. And that's really, really important because that's how we want to be judged. That's how I want to be judged. That's how I want you to think about me. Is, is he a nice person? Does he tell really good jokes? Does he try and look after us? Yes. Does it matter what he looks like? No. And that's really important for all of us. So when you grow up, when you meet new people, you know it doesn't matter what these people look like. It doesn't matter what religion they follow. It doesn't matter about their sexuality. It doesn't matter if they've got a disability only matters about their character and that's what the Equality Act is all about those protected characteristics that say it doesn't matter about a person because everybody has a fair chance okay and I know that all of those uh, all of the boys and girls at Wincham believe in that as well as I do right there we go guys that's our assembly for today have a lovely rest of the day have a lovely weekend 
and we'll see you next week. Bye bye.